But it's like one of those songs like Piano Man. Like everybody thinks that Elton John sang, sings that song. Billy Joel? Billy <laughs> <laughs> Joel? She always listens to I Don't Want Her To. That's just like my Alex at home. I'm like, Alex, oh, turn on my bedroom lights. Actually, you know what? Multiple that's, things named bedroom lights. There we go. That, that's our first topic, right? Okay, so, um, you know, right now I think in the industry we're hearing a lot about voice and how voice can change uh, many different verticals, but there's not, hasn't been a lot of talk on how voice could potentially change the automotive industry. So I want to hear your guys' thoughts and opinions on how you perceive voice potentially changing the way we market or the way we handle our day-to-day -day operations. I will start with Senior Matt. Thanks, Jason. I'll tell you, one of the things that I've seen is people are starting to use it now uh, out of laziness, just like a lot of technology, like replying to emails and text, because uh, I'm seeing a lot more typos and things, followed by sorry voice typing. Uh, and I know that because I am also guilty of it. But one of the things I think uh, that we're going to see a lot more of is like, there was a, I believe it was Hyundai or someone had done a commercial maybe a year or so ago out integrating with Alexa and Siri, right? Like Hyundai was talking about being able to use your phone as a car key and all that cool stuff. I think when it comes to voice, we'll see a lot of stuff like maybe remote start for your car, things like that. But until we get to autonomous vehicles, I, don't, I just don't think there's a lot for voice in a car anyway. But as far as the industry goes, uh, a lot of people are talking about the importance of voice with marketing, right? Google search showing up like that. Personally, I don't, I don't uh, know that maybe it's a lack of vision on my part, but I don't see a lot of other areas where it's going to be that useful uh, for voice stuff. Like searching through a website, there's some people playing with technology. Some of the developers I'm working with now where you can say like, um, you know, show me the staff and it'll take you to that page or I want to buy this now and it'll automatically take you to the product page. But I, I don't know anywhere else. What about what about you? What are you guys seeing? I mean, probably my voice search is still like Alexa. What what time is it? Alexa, you know, give me the address of such and such. Vehicles are a, it's a it's a aesthetic business. You can't be like Alexa, describe to me the Elantra, and unless she has a sultry voice, like mm, the Elantra is curvy, and you know, it's not it's. It's, it's a visual business, so I don't think it's ever going to get to the point where people are going to go through a process and go, Alexa, buy me the Hyundai Elantra. And it's like, okay, here, I bought you the Hyundai Elantra. It's, it's always going to be, they, they're going to want to see the vehicles, interact with them. They're never, people are never going to be solely reliant on a disembodied voice. They're going to want to, maybe they'll use it for their research and get different tech and features and things, but they're never going to go through the full process of this digital retailing through voice search. There's always going to be extra steps that uh, they'll want to go through. Plus, I mean, if you're optimizing your website, you're using SEO, you're, you're using other things to make sure that you rank. I mean, typically the search results come from those top rankings. So if you're doing proper digital marketing, you're going to be part of those returns. What do you think? No, I think, yeah, I mean, that's the key, obviously, is you definitely want to make sure that in your digital marketing, you're already uh, doing the right things to be relevant in zero-click search because that's not the future, that's now. And, you know, in terms of innovation, um, I, I think I'd probably agree. I mean, there's always going to be an, another layer uh, in the actual purchase. But in terms of uh, communication, me communicating with uh, the website as a consumer, uh, I think we will be to the point where I don't, I'm not clicking, I'm not mouse, I'm not grabbing a mouse and I'm not clicking any buttons. I'm telling the website what I want to see and the website is returning uh, the information. I mean, that's just, uh, I think that's the, the, the innovative future that we're, that we're moving towards. Um, same with, as Matt said, from a communication aspect, uh, you know, me utilizing voice to write my texts and write my emails and things of that nature. Uh, I try to do that as much as possible right now. My voice doesn't speak Texan, so I get a lot of errors. Uh, I, I get a lot of errors. And it's dangerous right now to let your sales people do that because a lot of us don't want to fix those errors. I will. I'm anal that way. I still type in complete sentences. My texts are all complete sentences, proper punctuate, punctuation. Everything from A to Z. Drives my kids crazy, but I can't help it. Um, but 
I think a, a lot of salespeople probably shouldn't be using it right now um, for that reason uh, until there eventually comes out with uh, some, you know, one of the phone companies, Apple, Samsung, not sure who it'll be, will come out with, with a smarter uh, voice app that is more trainable, right? Um, because that's the key with, with AI. AI is only as good as the education you give it. Mm -hmm. And we're in a huge education mode right now with a lot of the AI systems out there, particularly voice and Google with what they're doing with uh, Alexa and yeah, whatnot. They're still trying to find their home. Yeah, they still are. But that will eventually transfer over to, uh, to the phones and eventually transfer over to uh, even though I may only say something uh, utilizing a little bit of slang and whatnot, the AI is going to know the proper sentence structure for what I said, and it, it, that's what it's eventually going to, you know, someday down the road, it will eventually fix me and my bad habits to do better communication. So at that time, then it would be a great tool for the sales team. Mm -hmm. But, you know, until, then, until we get to that point, it would be very dangerous for a lot of, uh, a lot of people to use. They have built manners. It does, does, it does. Okay. Like when you ask Alexa to do something, and afterwards they like, thank you. Immediately it's like, hey, you're welcome. Have a great day, Matt. Like, I actually find myself saying thank you to Siri from time to time. Siri doesn't so, care, but Alexa cares. Oh, Alexa cares. Okay, fair enough. Um, <laughs> but I, I think what it is at the end of the day is that uh, either being a new technology, um, uh, a new AI, yeah, I think it's important for dealerships to carve out some portion of their schedule to at least just have the conversation. You know, what could this potentially look like for our dealerships, right? Um, I know a couple companies right now that, are, uh, that have service apps already built into the dealership, and they're looking at it from an opportunity of how they can connect that to either Alexa or Siri and just say, Alexa, schedule my car for service. Because the app already has that information, it seems like that could be that first, very first step where we're going to start seeing voice actually utilized in a dealership's day-to-day -day operations, right? But I, I think at, at the end of the day, I think it's having that conversation. And, and this, the, and, and I think that's what is, it's important. So the other question I had for you guys, I'll take it to the next, um, the next topic, which I think has been a topic for a really long time, right? And it's the topic of gender. The topic of gender has been in our industry for quite some time. And you know, my question is, how much of a conversation really needs to be had around gender-specific operations or processes or gender specific marketing efforts what are you guys' thoughts and opinions on that I guess I'll start I mean I, I yeah I obviously think it's important but I think let's I think both genders want to be treated a certain way and I th if personally that's where I would start I would start by making certain that I'm you know in my on my website, in my communications, um, that I'm doing anything and everything I can to communicate with people the best way I can communicate with people. Mm -hmm. And I, we still have a long way to go just to get there. Um, do, you, do you think that, I mean, we should go as far as documenting, documenting a separate process for how we communicate to either female or male? Personally, I, I personally don't think so, but if, again, it's for that reason. I think we communicate extremely poorly with a lot of, uh, you know, his, let's, let's start with history. Okay, yes, historically at the dealership, the dealerships, a lot of dealerships have treated females in a very disrespectful manner. They've treated males in a very disrespectful manner as well. They've treated people bad. And yeah, no, I agree. Their, their lack of, uh, the, the industry's lack of uh, communication hasn't been gender specific, mm -hmm. right? They're, they're, they are equally bad at communicating with both sexes. So um, I think a lot of men have just tolerated it more or longer, or a lot of men maybe communicate that way as well, so they uh, accept it. Whereas, you know, uh, women don't, and you know, they're they're more they, they get more sensitive about what's being said to them, and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
I think if you, as a dealership, if you instituted a process of treating people better, you're going you're gonna to satisfy both, men, men and women. It's, it's about so. making the communication about the people, not necessarily the gender. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's absolutely. The, okay, cool. Matt, any thoughts and opinions on it? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'll tag on that because I think uh, I, I would agree with what TJ is saying. But one thing um, that I think is fact is that, uh, at least since I've been in the industry in the 90s, is while both genders are, uh, you know, the industry treats people like they're children, right? They treat them poorly. But the, the type of uh, mistreatment, miscommunication is, is very different. Um, the, the things that women have had to deal with in the dealership, uh, female vendors and female employees, is, is a lot more on a chauvinistic uh, level. Clinton and I were having this dialogue yesterday about it. And the reality is um, my fiance is a vendor in the dealership, right? And uh, the best day in my life is, will be when she no longer works in our industry. <laughs> because she's in 10 to 15 dealerships a day, and it's like uh, blood in the water yeah. uh, is kind of the way that we equate the dialogue. And I'm just like, women have uh, historically been treated poorly. And, and vendors, like I remember working at a dealership in 2001, and I won't say the dealership's name, but in pulled the rep for a CarMart magazine, if anybody remembers this, it was a used car magazine, right? Used cars, like, a, like Auto Trader's rag that they had back in the day. And uh, I was a used car manager. We didn't have used cars in this book. And she walks right over the new car manager's desk. And uh, I'm like, he came back. They went to lunch. He came back. I'm like, dude, why are you going to lunch with the automar rep? He goes, oh, I do like a new car out of there. I'm like, why? It's a used car magazine. No one shops for new car. Hell, nobody shops for used cars. And it's about to go under. He's like, dude, she's hot. And we, so we go to lunch every month. I'm like, Okay, so you're spending $3,700 a year of our owner's money because you're trying to hook up with the Auto Mart girl. Like, that's, that's what this is, amounts to. And the sad deal is that is the, the, the gender difference that's taking place. Is, um, I, was, I was doing a keynote for a vendor company for their um, year-end deal last year. And one of their reps said, um, my dealers are afraid to hire women because they're afraid of a lawsuit, and it just made my blood boil because I'm like, well, maybe if you'd tell your salespeople to stop trying to bang every female employee, you wouldn't be worried about a lawsuit if you weren't such a piece of shit as a dealer. And I think uh, dealers get mad hearing it, but here's the reality. If you're afraid to hire women because you think there's going to be a problem in your store, maybe you should stop being an asshole. Uh, and then all of a sudden there won't be a problem with women. And that's a real talk that needs to be had uh, with dealers. But the, the challenge is, as, as vendors, we're often afraid to have that talk because we don't want to lose the dealer's business. But there's a flip side to this coin, and this also goes into a dialogue that uh, Clinton and I had last night. I worked at Cars.com for years, and we had a lot of female sales reps. And I'm very much of the mindset, if a dealer is like trying to come on to you, s smack him right in the nose, just like a cat would if a dog is sniffing him. Bash him right in the face, and one or two things will happen. It'll shut him down, or they'll be so scared to get in trouble, they'll buy whatever you're selling anyway. And, um, but the challenge is um, we've conditioned women in our industry to feel like they have to like just give it back to the guys. And what happens when we get into that mindset is we're validating the bad behavior of the dealer. If you're a female consultant and a dealer's hitting on you and putting you know, this uh, uh, obnoxious kind of pressure on you and you just like laugh it off and shrug it off or give it back to them, as Dr. Phil would say, you're giving tacit approval. So I would say if we, if we want to stop those kind of issues, don't accept it. Tell a dealer, you know what, that shit's not okay. Do it again, we're gonna have a real big problem. Now let's get back to talking business. And watch their face shift. And if they don't do business with you because you're not willing to let them try and be that way to you, fuck them. Don't do business with them. They don't deserve your business. Yeah, I won't necessarily speak really to the, the dealership side of it, not having been a GM, I don't wanna tell GMs how to do things in their dealership. You, you've done that. Yeah, but I think I'll speak more to a philosophical point and then more to the marketing point. One, you know, we don't have these rigid gender roles anymore. It's not like, well, my boy's not going to buy a pink Corvette. Well, yeah, he might if that's what he's interested in. My daughter's not going to buy a truck. Mm -hmm, she might. It's a, we, we've gotten beyond this idea of your assigned specific interests based on your gender. The marketing point of it is that because of the information available, because we have so much data, 
you don't have to pigeonhole yourself into gender marketing. It's interest marketing. What are they searching for? What demand is there in the market? And that's not gender specific, that's interest specific. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're addressing what people are looking for and how they're looking for and you're aligning your, your marketing efforts through social, through programmatic, through SEO, as long as you're addressing what people want and you're aligning your content with those expectations, you can disregard gender completely. Does that tie into, and that leads me to the question, I'm curious what your thoughts are, because I see, um, we'll call it a buzzword, if you will, we'll just call it like the, the, the buzz topic, but I've seen multiple people now in the industry like, how to sell cars to women, and how to better serve the female at the dealership, and I'm curious to know, I mean, other than treating someone with the respect and dignity they deserve, is there like a, is there a new fangled way? Because I think it ties into the marketing. Like people's interests are different. My fiance has four foot eleven. She drives a Ford F one fifty four wheel drive, XLT crew cab. I drive a Honda Element. Like my Element would fit in the bed of her truck. I mean, it would. But is is there really a need for all of this? How to sell cars to girls? Or is this uh, very much rah, 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 and dealers are buying it because they don't know any better? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I was even going to say, too, I mean, you can leverage, like, the automations in different channels like Facebook in which, you know, you can A-B test creative. Image with a guy, image with a girl. Maybe, maybe change the pronoun. See, which, see, does one perform better than the other? Then maybe you can make a decision on, if marking that specific vehicle in that specific language works for a gender better than the other, but you, then you don't also have to totally disregard. But you can, you can kind of test and see engagement rates and everything with, with A-B testing. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate it. That's, yeah, that, that's going to be, she, she's going to be the one that's going to pop him. It'll be her. Well, and, and I think guys listening to all, everyone, and it really it comes down to, and I think Dane, you said it best, was just how to communicate to a human. Mm -hmm. And um, again, I think this is a conversation that needs to be had because it's not a common conversation. We, 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 we train our staff on the activities to sell and service a vehicle. Hopefully we coach them through their efforts, but we don't, we don't really sit down and help them develop out their communication efforts. You know, we'll train them on the activities, but are we really training on, you know, the dealerships, those frontline individuals' communication efforts? Hey, guys, that's a good one. Um, another one I got for you. Um, we were actually talking about this the other night, and we were saying, you know, what's not being talked about at these conferences and at these seminars? And it seems like we're pretty good about talking about how we do business, you know, how we sell a car, how we service a car, how we sell parts, how we, how, how we engage with the customer, how we market to the customer. What seems to be kind of missing in a lot of these uh, events is the why we do it. We all know what we do. We, we sell cars, we service cars, right? But, you know, there's not enough dealerships out there that I think have truly defined why they do it the way they do it. You guys have any thoughts and opinions on defining a dealership's why? Hmm, how long do we got? <laughs> as long know, as you need, TJ. Yeah, right. <laughs> Obviously, one of the very first things any business, any organization needs to do is define their why. Um, and once you've defined your why as an organization, make sure that you def you know that that you verbalize that, um, so that in every aspect of your onboarding process with the, you know, the very first person you hire to the second, the third, the tenth, the fifteenth, everybody understands these are our values. These, this is our why. And understand that there's going to be times you make bad choices and you hire people you shouldn't. And there may be times you, you make bad choices and don't hire people you should. But when you do hire someone, no matter what their performance is, if they, if they don't meet your why, if they're not living up to your standard that you demand for your customers and for your business, you've got to get rid of them, period, no matter you know, what, what their performance level is. And I think that's where too many businesses in general make the mistake is um, 
you know, they, I, I call it the, the bullshit to production scale, right? The more bullshit uh, somebody has, the, the, the more production they better be doing because it has to equal out. And if you've got that person who has a lot of bullshit but no production, we're always quick to get rid of them. But it's the one who has a lot of production who's also piling on a whole lot of bullshit that because it's even and out, ah, we'll go ahead and accept it. And we can't. You, if, if, you, if that truly is your why, if those truly are your values, then you owe it to not only yourself and your customers, but to all the rest of the members on your team. Though it may hurt in the short term, you have to make a change. That person, either, you either have to help that individual change or you have to replace them. Yeah, a dealership is why I think a lot of dealers talk about the why they're in business. They focus too much on sort of like the superficial, like we're family owned and operated. That's great. I, I really commend you that you've done as a small business owner, genuinely. Nobody gives a shit. Nobody comes to your dealership because you're family owned and operated since 1970. A lot of dealers overlook the obvious whys. Like we work with a dealer who donates and who does charities, raises uh, tens of thousands of dollars for children with cancer. There's your why. You spend your whole year raising that money. Why isn't that on every single digital asset? Why isn't that in your showroom? Why isn't there some sort of banner or something that, that indicates that? Why, why every single ad you run, why don't you have the little children's hospital logo in the bottom corner? Like, why isn't that part of your digital assets? So I think dealers need to find their why and, and define it beyond sort of those, you know, stock standard definitions of, of who they are. I mean, you go on like a dealer's website, every single About Us page is the same story. We opened in 1950, and uh, Granddad Johnson ran the dealership. Now Grandson Johnson has it, and okay, great. That's a great story. Uh, okay, so you know, find the real reason that that's going to compel people to want to do business with you, and then, uh, you know, the, going back to the communication thing, every employee that works in your dealership should know about that, and that's I can say that as a small business owner because I don't have to be a dealer to know that. Everyone should know about your culture. That's, that's a general business concept that I think is pretty universal. So I think making sure that everyone has that buy-in of why. You know what? Yes, you're going to sell a car today because you want to make money and you want to keep a job. But you know what, damn it? You're also gonna, you're, we're we're going to work towards building this community of people who are going to donate to the children's hospital yeah, or whatever the cause is. You're going to sell the car this way because, all right? Exactly. I think... Uh, all, all of these, like having their why buy is important, but I think the reason that most dealers don't have a good why is because they don't really know who they are, right? So it's easy to say, well, all right, let's craft a why buy, but if, if at the core you say to the owner, okay, who are you though and what are you all about? Like what, what's important to you as the owner? Why, there are much more profitable things than having to spend millions of dollars updating signage. And like there are other businesses you can get in right now that are a lot less stressful and more profitable than running a dealership. Mm -hmm. Why do you still do it? You know, like, I think it, that's what I think is missing a lot of times is the dealer. We, uh, like in a lot of businesses, we lose sight of who we are and why we started it in the first place. And once we understand that, I think it'll be a lot easier to then craft that message to the consumer of why buy here and what makes us different, right? Because as Dean said, the why buy is the same everywhere, you know? Family owned and operated, great. Every dealership is owned by some family somewhere, right? Nobody, ca nobody cares. Yeah. So I think helping them figure out who, who they are and what they are, you know, why, why they even are in this business helps them then make that message for the consumer. 100%, and I think what's important is that dealerships realize that the why buy here is not just a marketing message. And TJ, to your point, it gives your operations a direction it's, you know, it's not just um, uh, you deliver a car, it's the reason why you deliver the car, the way that we've defined you should deliver that car, right? The way that we want, you're not answering the phone, just to answer the phone, right? The reason you're answering the phone that way is because it's defined by why we actually do what we do. Well, that goes back to the core of like, and hitting right on that, like, uh sales isn't about doing something to the customer, it's about serving the customer. The, I, I posted something the other day that said, I, I saw a salesperson um, or someone who actually runs a dealership, good dude, but he said, man, salespeople need to know how to work their customer better. And uh, as you'll tell from me, like a lot of things just piss me right off. Uh, statements like that. I'm like, how about instead of learning to work your customer, how about learning to work for your customer? 
Yeah, good point. Like, we're so busy trying to figure out what nifty word track will convert you from a maybe to a yes. How about forgetting all about your stupid word tracks and going, okay, you're here. Like, there are 20 dealerships on the street and you picked mine. Help me understand why. Hey, you've got a, a nice car that's three years old. Why are you thinking of getting rid of that? Like, help me get to know you. Let me, let me learn how to serve you by answering good questions. So I think uh, one of the things that would really help this is if we'd stop trying to work people and, and go back to realizing that if we want to make a good living, we've got to work for people. I like that. That's a good way. Thing got something to add. There, there's, a, there's a really great, great book by Seth Godin called Tribes. And I think, so going back to that point, you know, of, of like, what is that part of your why? Like I was talking about, you know, like the charities you work with. If you build a community of people who share that value, that, what better way to create lifelong customers? Yes. What better way to, and, and then, then your efforts can go to target the people who don't know about you yet or who don't yet engage with your dealership. And then you have that core people. And the big thing is, too, is, I don't, you know, I don't want to speak to exactly where automotive is now, but the follow-up. You, you made the sale, but why not three months from now? And this, like, again, this just goes as a small business owner. When we land a client, we're like, hey, how are things going? I mean, why don't more people really cultivate that ongoing relationship with these people that are within their community? I mean, there's no reason why people within five, ten miles of your dealership shouldn't be coming to you and going somewhere else, tra you know, traveling 30 minutes down the road. So, you, I mean, I really think th for any small business, cultivating that community is, is an essential piece, especially as, you know, more and more competition, more and more dollars being spent. Because you know what? Getting someone to care doesn't cost a dollar. I think, and again, this has all come back to it's, it. We're pushing dealerships to sit down and have these conversations. I was with a dealership the other day, and you know the the family owned dealership looked me straight in the face all family owners and told me that you know their why is the team that's downstairs their staff i said that's great and i really appreciate that but let me challenge it i asked for a growth plan for each one of those salespeople or each one of those all the staff members downstairs you know i understand your why but why do why does your team show up why, is, why does that service advisor get here every single morning? What, what is their plan? What is their goal and objective? And it was pretty eye-opening for them when they realized that even though their statement of their why being their team, they didn't actually know their team and what they were vested in and why they were showing up day to day. So I think that kind of goes into an, our next topic, which would be a great one, is growth plans, actual documented growth plans for each of our employees. What's your guys' thoughts and opinions? Yeah, before, let me just yes, a caveat please. to that. You know, and unfortunately, we live in a world now where technology is uh, degrading our ability to communicate with each other and to, sh to teach or, or to let each other know that we do really care, right? We live in a world where showing you I care now is just putting a quick little smiley face on Facebook, give you a thumbs up, right? Hey, no, I liked your state. Yeah. I liked your comment three days ago. I showed you I care, right? And unfortunately, that's, it's not going to improve. Uh, technology is going to continue to remove us from each other and from d knowing how to develop those personal relationships with each other. So it's important as a dealership, as a business, or really just as an individual person that we stop using technology in a lot of aspects of our life and just go back to having real sit down one-on-one -on -one conversations with someone right going downstairs and sitting down with each of those individuals um, having that one-on-one -on -one conversation not because you have to but because you genuinely want to know uh, about that person you genuinely want to know about their kids and their family um, and then taking time to show then that person, that individual person that you care, not just giving them a, a thumbs up, a like here or a like there. Don't you think, true, good point. Like, don't you think, because, uh, so, I, A, I agree with every bit of the need for that. One of the challenges that I have is um, I look at technology as like now we have the ability to 
to do that even better, right? So if I've got a person who works remote, I can, I can meet them on video face to face and have those dialogues. I think the challenge we face is we use technology to keep people at arm's length instead of using it for what it was designed for, which was to connect us, right? Like Skype, when it was the first and only kind of like video call deal when it first came out, was designed so that I could talk to TJ and we could have a face to face dialogue. FlickFusion has it built right in their uh, video email deal where someone can, you know, you, they could fire up a one-way deal so they can be private if they want, right? But like having that ability, I think that the technology, it's easy for us to make the technology the devil because it takes the focus off of the real problem, which is us not caring enough about our people. Like goes back to what you said, we've got to care enough to go have that conversation to know, okay, what is, if, if, if TJ worked for me, which would be a miracle, uh, but if he did, like for me to sit down with you every day, like remember the day when we were taught to have one-on-ones every day, right? Joe Verdi taught that in the 80s. It was one of the very few things that is still 100% relevant today that he said, right? Every day, how, how often should you have a daily one-on-one? -on -one? Every day. How long does it last? 15 minutes, you talk about three things. Tell me what you did yesterday, tell me the game plan today, and then the third thing was always supposed to be, what do you need from me to help you succeed? Mm -hmm. And a lot of us, we don't do that. Instead, what we do is we stand over our salesperson every day going, what do you got working? 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 How many, they're not four years old, right? Like, we need to care enough about them to go, okay, how do I empower you? How do I, how do I show you I care? I do the daily one-on-ones. I, I go, hey, TJ, 12 months from now, what's, like, let's sit down and do your goals. Let's write down, like, for the next 60 seconds or three minutes, write down every single thing you want to accomplish. Okay, now narrow it down to the top 10. Okay, now circle the top three. Okay, put those in order. Now that I know those of his is like, hey man, I want to go on a Hawaiian vacation with my honey. Okay, how much does that cost? Well, that costs 15 grand. Okay, cool. Now we can take the numbers and the data from you know how many handshakes, how many test drives, how many write-ups, how many sales, and I can back that math out and go, okay, to help you 12 months from now take that $15,000 trip, here's how many more hands, how many more test drives. Yep. But we don't know what powers our people because we don't want to sit down for 15 minutes because we might reveal that we don't have a fucking clue how to be a good leader. Well, because once, we once we know that information, we're now held accountable for knowing that information. So once it's shared with us, it's going to be our responsibility as a leader now to help them head in that direction. So. What is that? Ignorance is bliss, right? right? Is, is that's kind of what I think. And unfortunately, I, I think there are actually I think there are some managers out there that are doing an amazing job at oh, this. Yeah. But I think a good chunk of our industry could be doing a lot better at it for sure. Dan, your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I couldn't speak to how to grow a salesperson in their sales role, but grow a person as an employee. And, and I think Matt nailed it. What, one thing I took away from my work at a, a, one of the agencies I worked at was we called them huddles. We had the where, the what, and the what. Where are you seeing friction and getting your jobs done? What can we do to remove it? And what can I do to assist all of that? And did that every day, and it was about 15 minutes. And it, I mean, there was such clear, open communication. It's like this, and I hate to call it this, this is your circle of safety. Like this is your safe space, literally. I mean, it was like this is where me as your, you know, your, your, your boss, you can tell me whatever the hell you want. And there's no repercussions. I want your brutal honesty on what's going on. And if I'm the friction, if you say, where's the friction and it's coming from me, I wanna know that. Leadership is not about telling people what to do, it's about supporting them to get done what they need to get done to serve your clients and to serve your business and to serve themselves. So we had the where, the what, and the what with those huddles. And you know, think about like long-term growth plans. I mean, you think about, it's not just about like, what position do you want? Would you like to be a general salesman? Like, would you wanna be a dealer principal? Like, where? it's like, when you have the capacity to do what you love, what is it? Mm -hmm. And how can I help you get there? If you, if like, if you, like, if you really like, you, 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 you know, adopt dogs, you hate kill shelters. Like, what can I, as your boss, help you get to supporting these causes that you really believe in? And then, like, we talk about that tribes that support community. I mean, who would want to leave a job that supports you in so many ways, including your personal endeavors and what you want to do to make the world a better place beyond the walls of the dealership? No, I think it's really important, both personal and professional growth plans with your staff. I mean, you know, what we're talking about here, guys, doesn't cost the dealership money. 
But I'm telling you that if they sit down, and you guys all agree with me too, if they sit down and do this with their staff, it will probably be the most ROI positive thing they did all fucking year long. <laughs> it's just true. simple over it, right? They make the money because you, you, you don't have to go through the process of retraining and doing all these things. They're going to get people you know, ingratiated in your dealership all over again. I mean, it's, this yeah. is then all going to impact the previous conversation we were having. And that is now treating your customers like people. Right. Oh. Once your employees feel like they're being treated like people and you truly care about them, they then learn how to teach, how to, how to reciprocate that communication with their customers. And it's no longer about selling a car. It's about solving a problem. It's about helping someone. Then you guys start to see the theme of the topics I'm bringing up here. Um, these are things, like I said, are not necessarily going to cost dealership money, but will cost them time, but are incredibly ROI positive things. Next thing I want to talk about, and I know all of you guys have, are very passionate about this, and you guys probably have several four-letter words in some cases to talk about this uh, topic, but vendor accountability. I, I, look, we're getting into a time in, our, in the car selling season, all right, that it's, you know, the amount of units we, we sell on a monthly basis are going to get a little lighter, all right? And I find instead of us holding our vendors accountable, we just start taking an ax and blindly chopping things away. So uh, I think if, we're being, if we want to take a proactive approach to it, accountability is going to be a big part of that. What are your guys' thoughts and opinions on what a dealership can do to hold their vendors accountable? Well, as a vendor, I'm against it. <laughs> <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> uh, no, I think you're absolutely right. But, you know, unfortunately, it, it is a, uh, you know, a, a seasonal project. Yep when it really shouldn't be a seasonal project, it should be a daily project. So, um, you know, for, as a vendor, one of the things we, and we're in a weird position because our customers are other vendors uh, in a, in, in, on the most part. So we try to make sure we give our customers, the other vendors, the tools that they need so that they're able to provide that daily uh, accountability. Um, not just in, you know, here's a report to read, right? Because no, we know they don't get read, right? Oh, no, I, sent, I, I emailed it to you. There's a PDF in your, you know, uh, in the attachment. Yeah. You know what's going on. I sent it to yeah. you. Yeah. It, it, that PDF's <laughs> going to be there, you know, six months later, and it's not going to get open. So helping our customers, our, our vendors, um, increase the, their ability to communicate, mainly utilizing video, uh, video reports, video reporting, video content, so that they're able to uh, very easily um, on a daily level, weekly level, monthly level, annual level, um, have uh, that uh, as much statistical information as possible available mm -hmm. for, for their dealership customers um, and hold themselves accountable. You know, uh, if you're not seeing, if, if, if as a vendor, if you truly believe your product is going to have a positive impact, but for whatever reason the numbers aren't showing the positive impact you inspected, don't try to hide from that, right? Let's get that dealer on the phone. Let's get that customer on the phone. Let's, let's, let's try to figure out why. Um, because if, you, if your product truly is supposed to have the impact that it's supposed to have, there's probably a very important reason why it's not that needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. So, I think um, <clears throat> obviously I, I, I echo what TJ said, but there's uh, one other thing I'll add, and that is personal accountability. You know, a lot of times there's uh, so many new companies that are the shiny new object, right? Look at this new thing that ties into Facebook Messenger. Look at this new thing that'll tickle your butt when they call. <laughs> All this stuff, and dealers are like, oh, let me write a check for that. And then uh, 60 days in, they're like, oh, your product's shit. And it's like, dude, you didn't even do any research to see if it was a fit for your company. And shame on the vendor maybe for not selling it the right way too. But the reality is at the end of the day, um, if, if I buy a product, like, I've got to be accountable for making the decision to buy it, right? Am I actually going to commit to utilizing what I'm paying for? Um, and I look at it from both sides because I half of my career I spent on the dealer side and when I left the dealer side I was a training director for the Harold Ziegler Auto Group so I trained the general managers on down how to lead their people how to make good marketing decisions the whole ball of wax 
And then I went to work for Cars.com, where I met Marnie, and uh, and I was a sales rep for them and a trainer for them before launching Edmunds Direct to Dealer Program. So I've gotten to be on both sides of the fence for the same amount of time. And the one thing that hasn't changed is dealers still struggle with rather than looking at fixing the free internal things first and then making good decisions and being accountable. And I, I blanket statement this, right? Not every dealer, right? So for people to watch this later, they go, well, that's not me, man. I take the time. That's how I know Flick Fusion's good and Car Film's good. How I know that Reunion's good. Okay, I'm not talking to you then, Jack. <laughs> talking to the other 86% of dealers because that's about what the number is, is eight out of 10 of them that you'll meet with when you ask them questions like, well, what due diligence did you do? How many other dealer buddies did you call to ask about this product? and ask about what they're doing with it. How many, how, you know, did I ask Reunion, hey, can you show me a couple case studies? You know, hey, Flick, can you show me a couple examples of? If I've done that and those things pan out good and I do business with these guys, now it's on me to work the product and I'm gonna trust their judgment to go, hey, my most successful dealers are using it this way. Now, if I don't use it the way they've told me is successful and it doesn't work, well, then that's my fault because I didn't take the advice of the people that are the experts that have clients that they just showed me good results for. So I think vendor accountability is important, but how, how do you hold someone else accountable when you're not holding yourself accountable, right? That's like me trying to tell my kid, hey, dude, make sure you're going to the gym five days a week if I'm going zero, right? Now I'm going five, so I can be like, dude, how many days are you going? Uh, but still, he's fitter than me. But it's the same thing, right? Like, um, we talk about that, hip that hypocrisy all the time. It's like the do as I say, not as I do. You can't hold your vendors accountable if you're not holding yourself accountable. I think that's a silly thought. And, and I also think it's very difficult to hold your uh, vendors accountable if they don't truly know what the goal and objective was in the very beginning. I find that we're very quick to sign a check. Um, but we're, we are not good at all about really defining out what the ultimate goal and objective was. So uh, this is a perfect, uh, just reminded me of this. Uh, I was doing um, a keynote for the West Virginia Auto Dealer Association a couple months ago. And um, I, I said, uh, quick show of hands, how many of you have heard of Carvana? Right? And everybody holds their hand up. I'm like, right? And everybody hates them, right? And everybody kind of chuckles. I said, uh, let me ask you this. What does Carvana do to the consumer what does Carvana do that dealers, you know, that, that, that makes a consumer like them? Oh, they'll buy a car sight unseen, right? Like you can tell them your car, send them pictures, and they'll write you a check. They'll come pick up your trade-in. They'll deliver the car. They have a seven-day buyback guarantee. And then I said, quick question, how many of you guys are willing to buy a customer's car when they just text you the info and text you a picture? Show of hands. One out of 150 people in the room. I go, now let me ask you this. How many of you have ever bought a car at an online auction through a 360p camera that's blurry that you know is a rental car that people have smoked in, had sex in, shit in the back seat? How many of you have ever bought a rental car watching it go through the sale? Show of hands. Every hand in the room. And I'm like, okay. Here's an example. I go, what is Carvana doing that you can't do? Can you buy Marnie's car and have her send you 30 photos of the car and all the information on it? Yes or no? Yes. Can you send a flatbed to pick her car up? Yes or no? Yes. Now, what serves you better? Complaining about all the shit Carvana is willing to do that you won't or holding yourself accountable to do the things that it takes to sell more cars? Good point. And that's the big challenge. We want to complain about what everyone else is doing that's kicking our ass instead of looking in the mirror and going, man, I got to stop kicking my own ass. I'm glad uh, you two kind of already referenced this because it made me squirm a little bit. Like, if we're a young vendor, do we really want to say it? Accountability starts with the dealership first. I mean, really, I mean, so, so, <laughs> right? Well, I meant in terms of the age of business, anyway, not necessarily the age of the individual. I know. No, but, uh, so it's like, when we at Reunion don't land a client or we lose a client, we go, what did we do or not do first? Not what did, what did they do, what did we do? Um, and we try to learn from that. So I think on the dealer side, like if, you're, if, you're, if your chats are up and your, your leads, your form submissions are up, your phone calls are up, but sales are flat. Your sales year over year are, are down. Well, what's your, what's your process for handling those leads? And then they can't define that. They're not sure. I mean, we talked to somebody at the Rockstar in Detroit where they were like, half the staff doesn't use the CRM. I mean, so it's like, what? now let's say, let's say, you know, we know that only a small percentage of people will, will submit a form or you phone, you know, do a phone call. So if your traffic's up, look at other metrics on your site. What's time on site? What's the bounce rate? What pages are they looking at? 
So, so you look at all these other metrics and you go, okay, if all these look good, okay, what's your floor traffic been like lately? We got an answer like, about average. What, is that, what does that mean? What, what does average mean? And are, if you're just saying about average, like, like where, do you have your thumb on the pulse of that? So it's like, you know, we've had dealers that they're, do, they're killing it and they're like, why aren't we making more sales? I don't know. Can you, can you tell me? I've, maybe you edit me out of this section, but uh, maybe I had too many of these drinks here. But I mean, like seriously, no, yeah, uh, no, accountability should, right? No, accountability starts with you first. And I think when you're talking about vendor accountability, and here's the thing, unfortunately there were a lot of snake oil salesmen. And there's a lot of people who will obfuscate what's really happening. And they'll tell you, well, we have a proprietary system. Don't look at Google Analytics. What's Google really gonna tell you? We'll tell you more. Well, that's nonsense. You're trying, to, you're trying to veil what's really happening and you're, then you're bolstering the numbers to make you look good because your strategies are shit. So the first thing for accountability is education. And it's a lot. You don't have to be an expert in everything. You don't have, I'm not asking dealers to be certified in all things Google Ads and Analytics. But understand like the basic notions of what these tools are. So you can go, okay, wh like what's the source of this traffic? Oh, we're getting, we're getting traffic from, you know, we're a dealer in Chicago and we're getting traffic from Jersey. Well, that's a problem. So it's, it's understanding just these basic notions of the tools of all your vendors, from a digital marketing agency to chat providers, whoever. Understand the essentials, the foundations of what really makes success, and then ask them the right questions. I have a good example of those bad metrics in Kalamazoo, Michigan. There is a place called Y Bar. Now, they have uh, been multiple bars. They have failed miserably. wonder why. Uh, they're on a college campus where you should be doing $3 fruity cheap drinks. Let everyone get lit and just know when school's out for the summer, you're going to have a sucky summer. But they're hell-bent on being a restaurant as well. So they, they created this make-your-own macaroni and cheese bar. Brilliant, by the way. Brilliant idea. But what they did was run a Facebook ad showing this macaroni and cheese bar with all this stuff, bacon and all this cool shit, and did, they targeted the United States. They didn't do any targeting. Four million views in 30 days and so many comments like, we got to check this place out. Fucking none of them were, maybe 100 were in Kalamazoo. And then the next thing they wanted me to do was, hey, put it on our website, because they were a client uh, that I kindly unclienced uh, they were like hey we want you to put on our website like this you know four million views of our macaroni and cheese bar like the number one macaroni and cheese bar in america and i'm like but that's a lie. you just did shitty ad targeting <laughs> like four million people didn't commit i'm standing here right now it's lunchtime three fat people are eating macaroni and cheese and i'm not even eating it so, like, I'm not, there's three other people besides me at your mac and cheese bar, which is amazing, but it's not, it's not, it's not really doing that well for you. Your ad didn't do it. And all this owner wanted to do was brag about, like, we had four million people watch our mac and cheese bar video. And I'm like, but what did that serve? You spent a shit, you spent $4,000 or whatever you spent on views of your mac and cheese bar video. With no ROI, with three fat people eating it, they spend $8, they're going to eat $40 in mac and cheese. For what? Like, what did that do for you? So I think it goes back to, like, what you said earlier. Like, we can make a lot of good decisions if we have the right information. But we're just not. And then, and then we want to hold people accountable, flip the script. That same exact client, we ran a targeted local ad for them before that. That was very specific. Okay. Their cost per click on the ad was very low. It was like 70 something cents. It generated business. It led people to a gift card. This is uh, something that worked very well. It was like, hey, give people a $5 gift card to your shitty restaurant with no strings attached. They'll come in, they'll spend more than the gift card. You wow them with service, they come back. It's a strategy that grew another local bar 30% in three months. Louis, the bar that you were at, we did that strategy. They grew 30% within three months. This other bar, we did the same exact thing, right? Spent way less money. And they were like, well, we only had like a thousand people click on the ads. I'm like, yeah, you got 386 people added to your email list that, that joined that you can now market to for free every day. Local that live in Kalamazoo, like within 10 miles of your shitty place. Yeah, dude, but we had 4 million people view the mac and cheese bar. 
it was his go-to. So that just gives you the logic that is happening right now in all, all kinds of businesses. We're so focused on um, the 30,000 foot number, we're not looking at what makes sense. It's kind of like looking at like, oh, how many people liked my Facebook post today? Who gives a shit? How many of them bought what you were talking about in your post? Oh, zero, then who cares? And it really just kind of comes down just to a lack, again, a lack of goals and objectives, right? They, the goal and objective was not clearly defined there. The results they enjoyed, but really did not drive actual results. So, okay, guys, I got a, another one for you. Um, something that kind of has been, uh, bugs me a little bit, I and mean, I just consistently see it a lot, is, is that we keep talking about how as an industry, we need to be more customer centric, right? We gotta be more customer centric in our operations, in our processes, in our communications, in our marketing, but then we still maintain pay structures that are 40 fucking years old and are in no way or form customer centric at all. So if I can get your guys' thoughts and opinions on current pay structures and the lack of customer centric elements to it. I'll be short and sweet. I think that the dealerships, uh, here's my prophecy within 10 years, they'll look like Best Buy. Uh, and here's uh, what I would say within one year, they all should. Here's the fact of the matter. I don't think you take your current people that are on a commission plan and say you have to move to a salary bonus thing. I think you give your current employees the option to stay on whatever plan they're on. I think any new hires that come in need to have a base commensurate with experience that they can live on. And you put together bonus structures based on happy customers and volume results, things like that. We know your new car money. You guys are in a race to the bottom. I mean, it's, I, I think it's dumb, but I understand when every guy up the street is advertising giveaways, you, you kind of got pigeonholed, right? But at the end of the day, I think the compensation structure of the automotive industry, we're very late to evolve. Um, and uh, it's part of the reason why it's a hard time keeping people and keeping very good people. Um, so I, 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 that's where I'm at on that. I think uh, compensation needs, needs a, a pretty massive overhaul. Yeah, here, let's not kid ourselves. 92% of the people on the sales floor, that's a statistic I just recently pulled straight out of my asshole. Uh, that was awesome, uh, by the way. The majority of the sales floor shouldn't be called salespeople anyway, because they're not. Because you're not training them to be. You sit them down in front of OEM videos on the product and expect them to be a salesperson. A, a salesperson exists. There's a great book on Amazon. You want to write this down if you should pick this up today. It was Amazon uh, number one hot new release, as a matter of fact, uh, by a dude named Matt Koenig called Sell, uh, <laughs> Changing the Game Forever. Not so shameless plug. Um, but uh, it talks all about like we need to relearn how to sell, which is serving, evangelizing, listening, and loving our customer. You got to start with loving people. If you don't care about people, the rest of the shit doesn't matter. If you care, you're going to listen to them. If you care and you listen to them, you got a product that fits, you're going to be so excited about the product you have that you're oozing enthusiasm. And if it, yes. And then you're going, you're going to serve them by helping them make a decision and buy the right product. Yeah, like you're taking a bite of it too. You're like, mmm, look at how smushy this is. Like, but that's the thing is, yeah, there you go. That that's it. There, that you hit it spot on. There, there aren't any. There are very. I shouldn't say there aren't any. Mike Davenport, great sales professional. Ali Rita, Frank Craniti, they're beasts. They are great. Clinton Bramlett, boom, also great. And a guy who takes time and money out of his own pocket to keep educating himself. Okay. There are great salespeople out there that still invest in themselves and they're growing and learning. The majority of the industry is not filled with those. It's filled with people that dealers hire to fill space and, and they should just salary them and, and teach them how to serve people, answer questions. And the, uh, the old thing like don't say, can I help you? Throw that away. You know what? It's, it's okay to say now. When I walk in Best Buy, they're like, can I help you? And I go, yeah, I'm looking for a, a TV that's so big it would make my fiance mad that I bought it. And like, okay, let me show you this obnoxious one. They, but they say, can I help you? And they answer all the questions and never once do they push me to buy anything. And if I buy something at Best Buy, I have 30 days to bring it back. And they don't care. I can bring it back. They're like, is there anything wrong with it? I'm like, nope, I just got yelled at. I'm bringing it back. They're like, cool, here's all your money. And guess where I'm gonna go back to buy the next thing? Best Buy, because that's how they treat me. Amazon, same thing. If dealerships function that way, they would sell so many more cars.
I won't begin to approach the subject of sales structure, but or salary structure, but I will say this. There are so many tools. Well, I, I actually think you can because you're an agency at a flat rate, and there are very few that are out there. And that, that is so similar to what we deal with on the sales side is that you know these, these salespeople are commission-based. So their, their interest is not necessarily always in line with the customers. So tell us a little bit why you guys made that decision. That's actually a good point. Yeah, uh, you know, we wanted to be able to say with great transparency why we make the decisions we make. If we were commission-based, we could not necessarily be honest about certain decisions we make. So it's not directly aligned with like people in the dealership, but like we talk about like commission-based paid search companies. Whenever, you know, when you have a, a commission-based sale paid search company, like, they're tied to how much you spend. So they don't have any incentive to do the right things to keep your costs low. So I don't know in the deal, so that's why I said I can't really speak to I don't know what in the dealership that salespeople can do to influence things one way or the other. But what I, what I, what I would say is, what I would like to talk about is, is and, and Matt kind of hit on this, too, is, that, you know, I think there should, you know, if there's not any dealership, in your dealership, there should be a reward for rewarding people that are proactive. So there's like LinkedIn, there's CarFilm, there's all sorts of apps and platforms that you can leverage to connect with people. And if you're not out there being proactive to build a name for yourself and your dealership, then that's on you. And so the dealerships have something worked in their processes to understand and recognize people who are doing that sort of stuff. Like there's this girl, Allison sells cars in Raleigh, North Carolina. She works for, the, for an automotive group. And you just said, yep, yeah, you know who she is. Everyone knows who she is. Every, everybody I talk to knows Allison sells cars. She's, she does great at branding herself, and I hope that automotive group has rewarded her for it. Just like we, had, we were at a local conference, and we had four clients, and they're, they're potential growth clients, ask where a particular account executive was. And guess who's on our radar now? That account executive. So, you know, like I said, I don't really, I can't really speak to the parallels, you know, with commission versus, versus flat rates, you know, because, I, you know, I don't, I'm not that verse, well versed in, in the internal dealership uh, uh, parts. But, you know, just giving people an honest effort or honest ability to better themselves and, and feel like they get recognized, I think you'll get, you'll get stronger salespeople on that team. So the, the sad reality is fear is what currently runs the dealership. Our pay plans are structured out of fear. Fear that I'm going to hire someone, they're not going to perform well, and they're going to leave. Meanwhile, some people do perform well, and they start to rise and, and start getting paid. And we, as technology advances and, and new things, new innovations come out, we start adding these other tools. And we don't make our team use them because out of fear that they're going to get mad, the ones that, are, that have risen above and are now producing and making money, they don't want to use them and, because it's a change for them. And if I make them use them, they're going to leave. So... I let fear dictate whether all of these, this, these investments that I'm making into all of these new technologies that could help all of these young salespeople coming in produce at a significantly higher rate and help more of them make money sooner so that they do stay and stick around. So I have to invest less in hiring, get off that, that carousel that I've been on, but I won't do it because now it's it's fear that I have for the ones that are producing and what impact it would have if, if, I, if they left, right, or if I started making those changes. And, you know, there are so many tools out there right now today that a new salesperson coming into the automotive industry could utilize to make more money than probably any other industry that exists in a shorter amount of time 
to not only brand themselves, but to brand, help brand the dealership, communicate with customers the way customers want to be communicated with, um, automate so much of the communication process for you so you don't have to, uh, you know, sit down and, and do as much work as you used to physically have to do because technology is doing so much of that work for you now. It could be so easy. Mm -hmm. It really could. It could really be so easy. As but lo As long as we take the time. But, I st <laughs> but now, if I did that, my pay plan would be way out of whack, and I'd be paying everybody way too much money. So, right? So sounds like a good problem to have. To be honest with you, that, that I, I, the reality is, it is it would be a great problem to have. But um, I, I, we look at the utopia. You know, we we look at the world we'd like to live in, and it would be a world where the dealerships had salaried employees, um, salaried uh, product specialists, not salespeople, relieved a lot of that pressure that the salesperson feels like they have to be under every day to. Um, that, that has a negative impact on their relationship with their potential customer yes. that helps um, them really focus on just selling this one car instead of creating a customer for life, instead of really helping me embed my dealership into the community, which is going to eventually help all of my, my entire family, my entire team. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's the utopia. And though all the tools exist out there right now that would really make it easy for a dealership to live in that world, um, I think fear, that fear of the unknown, is such a powerful emotion. I don't know if we're ever going to see it in my lifetime. Well, I agree with you, TJ, but I, I think it's not just fear as much as is the fact that if I do know, now I have to be responsible for the fact that I know. So there, it, there, sometimes there is fear, but then there's also in the comfort of not actually wanting to know. You know? But I, I think what we're kind of saying overall, guys, here is that we really need to start taking a look at our team as an actual team. I mean, there is no other professional sports team that is managed and paid and put together the way we put them together. We are constantly looking for that superstar. We're not creating an actual team effort. Rewarding our staff for their efforts, not necessarily their results, sounds like it's going to be the most customer-centric approach that we can take moving forward, knowing that those efforts are going to yield us the ultimate results that we're looking for in the first place. Well, this has been promoted. Joe Ver like Joe Verdi, to go back to old, very old, mm -hmm. he promoted this a long time ago, though. He always said, like, 30 days is a month, 60 days gives you an idea, and 90 days is an average. And one of the things when I first went to manager school in 99, uh, 20 years ago, was I learned to look at the numbers. So you watch it for 90 days. Hardest thing in the world is being patient enough to watch it for the 90 days. And then I would look, okay, across my sales team, how many handshakes did they have, right? How many people did they greet? How many test drives did they go on? Joe had like 83 things to measure, but there's really only four. How many people did you meet? How many drove a car? How many did you show a price? And how many bought? And if you had those metrics, I could do the math to give you a raise immediately. I would know which area you were struggling. Was it the people you meet to how many you get in a car? Was it the people? So the whole time he was like talking about stop focusing on results. If you focus on the activities, the re results will come. So just get people excited about the activity. Stop trying to hold them accountable to the results. Reward them for results, but just focus on helping them achieve the activities. If we did that today, right now, if we just stopped going, okay, I need Dane. Like right now, here's what happens. Every freaking sales meeting to start the month. Jason, you did 18 cars last month. You could, you could push out another two for me, right? You get 20, couldn't you? Jason's like, eh, sure. Uh, sure, boss, no problem. And I'm like, Marnie, now you and Jason are always going head to head. He's going to do 20. You can outdo him, right? Come on, what, 21, 22, what do you got? I go around the room. By the time we're done, we're doing 400 fucking cars. <laughs> Last month, we did 120. And that was the best month we've ever had. But now we're going to all of a sudden do 400? Just because I did this big circle jerk in the sales meeting where I made everyone feel like they should outdo each other? 
And then I walk out of there, and instead of going, well, that was stupid, uh, now I go, hey, halfway through the month, Marnie, you told me your new 21 cars. You've only got six out. What's going on? I don't know, boss, you're stupid, and you made me say a stupid number. But she won't say that because then I'm going to go, well, you go work somewhere else. Well, gosh, then who am I going to have move the cars when I call it a lot party? <laughs> right? Lot party. Like there are things that we've like been doing party. that, like, hey, we're going to have a lot party. What's that consist of on my first day? Oh, we're going to put balloons on shit and those big cardboard things that spell the word sale if you put them in order. Uh, and then we're going to move all the cars around and magically customers appear. No, I've been to a party. It's nothing like that. That is not what a party is. We, we've just got to do an overall culture change, man. Like every single thing we're digging into today goes back to at the core what Tim said at the very beginning. We've got to start treating people like people. When you hire an adult into an automotive sales position and you tell them you can make six figures in this job, treat them like a six-figure executive. Great, you make your schedule. You are not going to hire a stockbroker or a lawyer and then tell them to go move cars in the parking ramp. No, that's a six-figure person you brought on staff. Treat them like a six-figure person. Here's the corner office. Kick some ass. Whatever you need from me, my job is, I might have the title of your boss. I serve you. What do you need? You tell me. I'll make that shit happen. You just produce. That's why I hired you, because you're capable. And then let them, empower them and let them be. Let, let them do their thing. If they can't do it, great. Then if, if you've done everything to help them and it doesn't work, you can part ways. But stop hiring people and lying to them. Oh, you can work your way up to what? If the sales manager or the GM doesn't die, there's no room to move up. There's not. Everything that we do in, oh, man, you're going to get me all turned up now. Oh, here it comes. Everything here it comes. we do is a lie. We start this business, we start with a lie. We hire people on a lie that there's room for advancement when there's not. That's, there's, why, why do we say that? And then afterwards we go, listen, Marnie, why do you want to be a manager anyway? Selling is the best position in the store. Then why don't you put that in your fucking ad, Jack? Selling's the best position in the store. It's true. It's the only one where you have 100% control over your income. So put it in the ad. Tell people that at the beginning and continue to tell them that. And then show them that. Show them the math of how that can be the best position in the store. Stop pretending like there's some room for it. It's not a factory. You don't sit there for 20 hours and then get promoted because the union said so. We've got to start treating this like what it is. If you're going to be a sales organization, be a sales organization. If you're not truly going to be committed to one, salary your people, make them product specialists, and do what you are avoiding doing and watch how much better production you'll get. Gosh, I just get so darn angry about it. Yeah, and stop working on that. <laughs> They have kids and shit. No, you have no life. Yeah. I mean, you have kids, but you don't know. <laughs> One of the things I was just thinking about is sitting here and listening to Matt sort of talk about his perspectives and stuff. And so I just thought about it. Suddenly struck me as like you know we talk about in digital marketing side like the synergy of things like deliver on expectations. And I can't believe I didn't think to talk about this earlier. So I was in the market for a car, and someone mentioned Buick, and I was like, oh, Buick, that's like my grandfather's car. Like, I'm a, but they're, they're actually pretty sharp. So, so I submitted I submitted a form for a Buick Verano. So I, somebody contacts me. I go to the dealership and I meet the guy and he goes, you submitted for that Verano, but I got to show you this enclave. <laughs> Wh excuse me? Why? Like that, right? It's like, I, I told you what I, I told you what I want. That's because there was a spit <laughs> on that. On, on, right? So it's like, so talking about like, you know, that might you know, feed into the pay structures thing. Like, you know, he's like, this is a more expensive vehicle. And you're like, as soon as I walk in the door, you're you pushing me right into that before you even address what I actually wanted when I walked in the door. Yep. So guys, uh, if I could put this into an equation, and this is what I'm listening to you guys, um, you know, for now, and I appreciate everyone's input. It's, it sounds like it's people plus profits equals efforts, efforts multiplied by culture creates the results. Sounds like I failed in math. I'm pretty, I did too, but um, <laughs> I'm pretty confident that's what it, it, it looks like. Does that, sound, does that sound about right? I'm just gonna say yeah. Well, it, it's the yeah. third scotch in me says yes. <laughs> I, you know what, I think if we put people first, uh, it's pretty easy to make everything else work. And that's, uh, I think that's the biggest opportunity we have. And one thing that no one wants to talk about, and if you were to go back and watch a video of Craig Lockhart and I talking a digital dealer about four years ago, 
I said, I hate uh, every time when automotive news comes out and they say, oh, sales projections are down. Uh, it drives me nuts. I'm like, self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, and then I went to a real estate workshop, and uh, sometimes you can't see the forest through the trees. And one thing no one in this industry is talking about that everyone needs to prepare for, uh, that we're not, is um, 08 was nothing compared to what's coming. 100%. Um, in 2008, when we crashed, there were a little over $70 trillion in derivatives floating around. There is 1.2 quadrillion right now. Uh, I, I'm not good at math, but it's like 200 times or more worse. Uh, which means when I see people like my good friend Patrick O'Brien talking about how, man, if you just work the bank right, you can get a 580 into a BMW 7 Series. Uh, and I'm like, okay, uh, 90 days in that car's yours again. Um, when you see like mortgages being written uh, to folks that apartment complexes are saying no to, uh, that all should be a sign that a crash is coming. That's just real life. And we have one coming. And here's what I'll tell you. The beautiful thing about an economic crash is that the cream rises to the top. The companies like the people in this room will still be here because they're doing the right things. They're serving their clients. They're putting people first. The companies, a crash is coming. Um, that's, it would have been great if you keyed up Dave Matthews. Crash into me. Um, but the reality is when it crashes, it's going to be the biggest crash since the Great Depression. Uh, which means a lot of people out of jobs and a lot of people um, losing homes and cars. And if dealers want to, the only way, this is my belief, and uh, I'm glad that you're recording this because I'm going to, I told you so the shit out of friends five years from now. I'm, I'm really going to. There's no shame in that. I'm, I'm owning it now. Uh, five years from now, at the latest, when this crash hits, uh, the dealers that put people first and right now start focusing on their repeat and referral customers. How can I reach out to the 5,000 customers no one has talked to in the last 90 days? If I'm a dealer right now, the first thing I do when I go in my dealership is, um, which was, <laughs> was gonna be my presentation, is I have a sales meeting that starts with an apology for not doing my job as a good leader and doing daily one-on-ones. Now, I wouldn't have this meeting because I do this shit with my people, but for the 92% that aren't, first thing you do is go back and have a sales meeting saying, I'm sorry, I didn't do this with you before. Starting tomorrow, every day, we're gonna have a one-on-one. -on -one. And this is, we're gonna cover three things. Yesterday, today, and what I can do to serve you. The next thing I would do is have everybody, I'd pull everybody's um, customer list that they haven't talked to in at least 60 days. And five times a day, five people a day, they would be calling them going, like a ring, ring, and Clinton answers the phone. I go, hey Clinton, this is Matt over at Dane Motors. How's it going, bro? Dude, listen, uh, I got to apologize to you. I have not checked in on you in a couple months. I feel bad about it. When you bought your car for me, I told you I was going to take care of you, and I feel like I've done a crappy job of it. So I'm going to do a good job of it starting now. So I got a couple things just so I can update my records so I can take care of you. Would it be okay just real quick if I run through and make sure I've got your stuff up to date? Cool. Obviously, your phone number is the same. Address still the same at 123 Any Street. Email address still Clinton is awesome at abc.com. You are the man. And last time that I talked to you, you had your car and your wife's car, still just the two of you in the home that are driving vehicles? Cool. And between you and your wife, just so I make sure, so I'm not one of those salespeople calling you every week trying to sell you a car, between you and your wife, who's next to replace theirs? Nice. When you say she is, soon down the road? About a year from now, when the time comes, you guys know if you'll be going new or used? Cool, man. Well, hey, when it gets a little closer to that year, is it okay if I reach out to you and see if I can help you guys? No, I just got a referral. I know that within the next year, his wife's going to be in the market for a car. Boom. I do that five times a day. Four people give me that info. By the way, I made every one of my salespeople do this five days a week. I'm, I'm not a math major, but I could do this math. Five times a day, you get four referrals a day. And you could do this with all your customers because you know you haven't followed up on shit. Okay? Now, that's four a day times five days a week is 20 a week times four weeks is 80 referrals a week now if your closing ratio is 10 percent if you're weaker than circus lemonade okay and you close 10 percent that's 80 a month now if every one of them is a year out if you're a 12 car salesperson next year at this time you're a 20 car salesperson all you have to do is pick up the phone and update your records start with an apology and then just update your info and boom you just added eight cars to the deal you do it five times a day. 
I had a kid named Chris Gilday who was scared to death of doing this, and he didn't have any old customers. He didn't want to call orphan customers. So I said, hey, let's go for a walk. He goes, okay, because that's how he was. Uh, he worked for like four-year entertainment in the mall. They had a union. His like, second day on the job, I was like, where the fuck is Chris? He was in the uh, customer lounge eating chips. I go, what are you doing? He goes, I'm taking my break. I was like, this is the car business. We don't have breaks. Fuck your chips. Get back out. Um, Kyle, I was an asshole. That's, I'm just being honest. <clears throat> but uh, Chris didn't have orphan owners call, like uh, or previous customers. So I was like, take a walk with me. Because I, I was like, dude, the service department's full every day. Just go in there and be like, hey, I got a quick survey. Uh, who wants to go first? Raise your hand. Someone will raise their hand. Well, he didn't believe me. He was scared. I understand. So we get in front of the service lounge, and there's like 15 people in there. I go, good morning, everybody. And they all kind of looked up like I had a nipple in my forehead. And I was like, my name's Matt. Uh, I work in the Nissan department here. We're doing a quick survey of our service customers. It's a lot more fun than sitting here. Who's first? And I put my hand up, and the guy flinched and put his hand up. And I go, great, come on over. And I go, what's your name? He goes, Steve. I go, Steve, this is Chris. He'll do the survey with you. And I walked away. And Chris took him in his office and went through. It was pre-printed, simple questions. Dude was like, his wife was in the market in four months, but their kid was about to graduate high school, and was, they needed a car for him now. Boom, boom, two referrals right there. Chris went in, worked a whole service lounge. He had like 15 referrals. The hardest thing I had to do was get him to stop working the service lounge all day and actually start like setting appointments to sell cars. Fast forward time, the kid worked for me for a year and a half. He got recruited and went to work for Ford. He crushed it, did a great job, went to work for Ford. Like, he was a great salesperson because he learned, like, oh, all I have to do is just focus on the people that have already liked, trust, and respected the dealership. If dealers want to protect themselves from the things we never want to talk about, which is the impending crash, they've got a gold mine of customers they're sitting on, and there's a million great data mining tools out there that can line it up and tee it up. But really, you got a telephone in your pocket and a list of people you haven't given a shit about for at least two months, and you could start there and make a ton of money. Well, I think that's actually a good segue into our next topic uh, about tools. Um, the last few years I've been to NADA, it has absolutely blown my mind on how many new vendors and new tools and new shiny objects are in that convention center every single year. And the funny thing is, I don't see that number dropping anytime soon. So um, your guys' thoughts and opinions on get rich quick, diet pill type products and solutions. Well, I mean, that's really an easy answer. Right? <laughs> I mean, but what, what can a dealership do to ensure, because they're going out there, they're, they're going to these conferences, right? They're, they're being bombarded with, with all these new products, and, and some of them are pretty damn impressive sounding, right? As a dealer, how do I identify, is this, is this a product that is actually can bring me and my team value, or is this just a, you know, uh, lose 20 pounds in a week diet pill? Yeah, and you know, there are all kinds of new innovations coming out that do have a lot of legitimacy and, and should be tried. Should, you should take a chance on and a flyer on. Um, there are a lot of young companies popping up that have great people and great ideas that um, just need somebody to, uh, you know, believe in them and give them a shot, and they'll work wonders for you. Um, but then at the same time, uh, I think every dealership out there, there's, a, there's just always this love-hate relationship between dealers and vendors, right? And, and, I, and, I, and I, it's rightfully so. There's a lot of vendors who have <laughs> cheated their dealers. There are a lot of vendors who haven't had good products um, but sold them to good people and, and took advantage of dealers. Um, it's, it's, histor it's, you know, it's historic. It's, some, it's been going on for a long time. It's not going to stop. Um, that's just the world we live in. Mm -hmm. So meanwhile, though, there are also a lot of good vendors, both young and old, that do truly care about their customer and who will go out of their way to work for their customer. And, you know, how do you n differentiate between the two? It's really uh, probably goes beyond just going to the conference and, you know, seeing the vendor when they're putting on a show, right, at the circus. Um, 
going beyond that and in addition to talking to other dealerships, talking to other people in the industry, uh, attending a lot of conferences like this, you know, really getting to know uh, the different people that are out there because there are a handful of guys out there. I don't care what company they're with. I'm going to believe in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. they're, I know them. They're good people with a good heart. And if they're, they have a lot of pride in their name and their reputation, and if they're putting their stamp on this company, this is a good company. And there's some of the opposite as well. So, Do you think just, there's any qualifying questions you think that a dealership should ask? Any tall tale signs that this is more of a, like I said, get rich quick, diet pill kind of thing? Well, obviously, the, you know, the old statement, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Oh, okay, there you right? go. That's, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, if this vendor is promising, you know, all of these different uh, great things and it's guaranteed and, you know, uh, you don't have to, uh, yep, it's exactly, it, 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 it's probably, it shouldn't sound that easy because I don't care what product it is, as Matt was saying uh, earlier, there has to be, a, you're, you as a dealership, you have accountability in this equation as well. Mm -hmm. You have to be willing to commit to changing the internal processes that need to be changed, to committing the, uh, the people that need to be committed uh, for these various products to work to begin with. And I think that's probably just about any product out there. Um, so if you are not, those are probably some of the questions you need to be asking, yeah. um, you know, and if you're not willing to make those changes and make those commitments, uh, it doesn't matter how good the bright and shiny object potentially could be or should be, it's not going to work for you because you're not willing to, uh, make the, uh, the changes or the internal investments that you need to make. Uh, into into making those tools work, yeah, you know. Tool, tool is only as good as how well someone can use it. It is, and yeah. and you know, there's a lot of of vendors out there that have competing products, do things similar, do things different, and some of them are great fits for some dealers and not great fits for other dealers. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's vice versa, right? Another a, a different vendor with a, a slightly different product that does things a slightly different way might be a great fit for this segment of dealers. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got to, you, you've got to understand as a dealer, just because I tried this product and it didn't work, doesn't mean that products like that don't work, good right? Point. Very good point. Maybe, you, maybe you just tried the wrong company. Yeah. Maybe that company wasn't a good fit for you. Maybe let's try one of these other companies that might be a little bit better fit for me and my organization as well. So it's hard to say, you know, there's, there's a lot of great uh, companies out there that have amazing products that absolutely fail at some dealerships. And it's usually, sometimes it's that company's fault mm -hmm. because of their lack of follow up and their lack, lack of commitment to that, co to that dealership. And then sometimes it's the dealership's fault because of their lack of commitment to that vendor. It's, it's hard to say, it's hard to put a finger on, is there one thing that you can, you know, say or do to, to recognize that and change that? If there is, I'm, I'm not sure what it would be. I think for me, uh, I'll just say this, when there's a shiny new object, um, I understand that uh, you know doing contracts with a with a new thing helps set revenue goals so you can plan for your marketing things like that. But uh, as somebody who started a few companies, taking some hits, taking had some successes, the one thing I think is when you put out a a brand new like if you're like okay we have this shiny new Facebook tool that's going to change everything, give people the ability to get out of it within 30 days. You know what I mean? Like you gotta you've got to be willing to mitigate the risk for people if it's a shiny new object. If it's a shiny new object and they're like, listen, we got this new thing, but you got to commit for a year, two years, three years, four years. It's never been done before, but I want you to commit for three years. Uh, that, to me, might, might make me a little wary. I'll tell you, though, I buy a lot of tools um, like uh, that come out that are new. Like We have different stuff, like uh, different integrations that we use on the website. Um, I build a lot of sales funnel stuff. I think a lot of it goes back to do we fully understand what we're buying, right? Because a lot of the shiny new tools is really just a shiny new marketing spin on an established idea. 
Um, and so we really need to do our due diligence to understand what we're purchasing. I, I kind of equate it to, I hear a lot of people, um, I bought like all Ty Lopez and all these guys stuff, right? Internet marketers to see who's different. Who, Billy Jean, Ty, what, they're all selling the same thing, right? But everybody got all hyped up on the words sales funnels when they came out. But uh, people bought click funnels and all these other tools and they were like, well, I didn't, I didn't make any money though. It's like, well, yeah, dumbass, you got to build a funnel. You got to run an ad. You got to drive people to the landing page. You got to walk, a funnel is just a series of, of processes you walk someone through to get the end result, right? And so I think that the challenge is you got to know what you're buying, which means you've actually got to ask the questions. Um, and sometimes you have to pause your enthusiasm True. so that you can do your due diligence. Uh, I have a hard time doing it. I love to, I love to buy stuff that's cool. Um, but, uh, but that's, that's the real thing I would just say when you go to NADA and all these other things, pause the enthusiasm for a minute and, and have them walk you through the logistics. What's the process? How's it work? How do, how do I, how do, how do I make this work for me? And is there anything I can control to make it work better? You know, I look at a tool like what FlickFusion has. There are a million things you can do to take control of that video and make it work better. Same with car film, right? I can shoot videos. I can change which landing pages I have underneath. I can do all that stuff, right? I, I can take control of those aspects. So if I don't get the results I want, I can be in control of changing how the customer receives it. Um, with, with a lot of the shiny new objects, that's one thing I think we forget to ask is, hey, what can I do to tweak this if it's not getting me the results I want? Yeah, they both uh, kind of said everything that I was going to say, but I'm going to break it out in a couple different ways here, though. We're going to start with you next day. <laughs> so, I mean, with, with, with a shiny new object, it's, it's really a matter of, you don't have to be a genius to spot bullshit. So, like Tim said, if, it's, if it's too, it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So, you got to do a couple things. And Matt said, ask questions, ask specific questions. Like, how do you know this product's going to work for my dealership in this market selling this many cars with this competition? Oh, you've never worked with a dealership like mine before? So, so explain to me, like, how do you know this product is going to work? What, tell, tell me specifically what are you going to do that's different than everybody else? How this, oh, hey, does this integrate with, with this vendor that I have? What are the synergies between the two? Like, figuring out, like, how it works. And then, like, three months from now, six months from now, you want me to make this commitment, three months from now, what is, what is, my dealership look like working with you, what's going on? Six months from now, what does it look like? 12 months from now, what does it look like? And if they don't have a logical growth or progression plan of how things will evolve, then I call bullshit. The other thing then is too, is, and it's not necessarily a shiny new object, but if you know, you're, you're sort of unsatisfied with your current partner, then it's you know, asking for case studies, testimonials. Like, like, connect me with somebody in, that's a dealership similar to my, you know, you have a Toyota dealer, I'm a Toyota dealer, you have a Toyota dealer who's in a similar geo like mine with similar population, similar cars sold, and then, so I can talk to them and find out how did things actually go working with, 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 with this company. So it's, it's a matter of really doing your due diligence. And, you know, as a vendor, I would love to walk up and go, do you want to do business? You go, yep. But on the other side of it, I want you to, to do your due diligence. Really dig in and be deliberate and go through the process. Like Matt said, curb your enthusiasm and sit there and, and hear, hear what they have to say. Ask the right questions. Do a demo. Talk to other dealers. Have, you know, like, have a communication. Like that's, when we talk about you know, like education, there's a dealer out there that probably worked with them or worked with a similar company or has other insights about how this tool actually works. And then the last thing would be, how much work do I have to do using your product? Dealers have so much to do. And I know that I don't need to have worked in dealers to know that dealers have a shit ton of work to do. So are you, gonna get, are you giving me 20 more hours of work a week to use your product? Or is this something where I can just you know, either get a report from you and you're transparent or it's a simple tool that I can integrate easily and there's not really anything else I have to do? And so it's really just a matter of really digging into and finding out, it, does this company match my needs mm -hmm. on so many levels. So I, I love what all of you guys are saying. I mean, fr from making sure that there's a plan in place to being deliberate in who you're talking to and um, what questions you're asking them, but the, also the word intentful. The, the, these are all kind of consistencies I see with all of you guys. So I think the, the, the bottom line is, is dealerships, you, you guys are going to these events you know, there's going to be vendors there. There's going to be some great vendors there. There's going to be some that are going to be selling some snake oil, but going in with a strategy, right? Really identifying what the goal and objective is, you know, saying, all right, here is a, you 
know, here's a point in our process that you know, we're, we're doing okay with, but we don't have a system that's necessarily measurably in the efforts, efforts of it. So if we go in, can we find something that necessarily looks like this, right? Going with a plan of attack, a game, game plan, sounds like it's really gonna be the best way for a dealership to kind of overcome the diet pills or the get rich quick you know, type products or services. You know, one quick thing too is with conferences, and as a vendor, we fi find this very frustrating, is you, you know, a dealer pays to come to a conference and they flip their name tag over and they look at the floor and they scuttle by you. So here's the thing, same thing, you know, you're, 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 all these different vendors, they, you know, they're working with dealers, walk up to them, say, give me one reference. That's, well, I'm not gonna talk to you, give me one reference, give me, a, give me a phone number. If they're not willing to do it, then that's probably a problem. Give me one reference, someone similar to my market, go, Call them, leave a message, hey, this is so-and-so, I run a dealership similar to yours, I, was, I, I walked by the reunion marketing booth, and, and, and uh, I just want to talk to you about like, how are things really going with them? And then you get from the horse's mouth like what is really happening and not some filtered perspective. And if you like what you hear, then the next day, go back. You're never going to learn anything and you're never going to engage with new companies if you avoid them at all costs. I mean, I understand the not wanting to be clawed at, but I never, like, you just spent 700, I just, you spent 700 bucks to come to this event to not talk to anyone. That just, it's stupid. I don't, I don't get it. I just think, you know, it's, it's like that fear of, like, the fear of people going into a car dealership. I'm going to be hounded and hassled and everything. And, you know, so th then vendors need to hold themselves accountable and not hassle and haggle and hound dealers. Yeah. But, like, but then we're forced, like, we feel like we have to because you're not, at all engaging, but you know, but like I said, just be very, just be very deliberate. And just say, you know what? Just give me this reference, and I'll be back if I want to be back. And I guarantee you, those vendors are not, you know, they they get it. We get it whenever you you're really against talking to us. I mean, we're not a three-headed dog. Guys, I, I wanted to take this time and thank you so much for uh, you know jamming with me today. There's just been some amazing knowledge nuggets and just wisdom and some great guidance and what we talked about today. I, um, for everybody that's going to be watching or listening to this and would love to connect with either one of you, what is the best way? Well, Dan, we'll start with you. What is the best way to connect with you? Yeah, uh, just a number of ways you can uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on there. Or uh, just call me at 919-413-1975, and I'm happy to field any calls and, and voicemails. Simple as that. <laughs> uh, the best way to reach out to me is just to email matt, M-A-T, at rockstarinfo.com, or uh, shoot me a text, 269-312-1787, or follow me on Instagram, at realmattkanick. The best way to reach me is to shoot me a video message, a video text, <laughs> live stream with me via our website, yes. or uh, shoot me a video uh, email. But uh, you would send that to t period james at flickfusion.com. Thank you, everyone, for watching this and who are listening to this. Uh, please check out also my page, strategywithjason.com. We're going to have this information out there. You guys have a wonderful day. Thank you guys so much for taking the time to jam with me. Thanks.